Gareth was a hat, uh, actually wears several hats. I, I make it very brief. To mention a few, he's practicing clinical geneticist, genomic policy advisor, clinician scientist, and entrepreneur. He equitably translates innovations for public health through public, private, and multiple stakeholder partnerships. One thing I just make a special uh, introduction for him. I'm very delighted to mention that he is the member of the advisory board of directors for Indian Organization for Rare Diseases. We are very honored to have him. We are grateful for his valuable advice to us on various occasions in the past. Gareth has led the clinical implementation of the genomic and phenom phenomic digital health technologies and omics associated policy. He directs the Undiagnosed Diseases Program Western Australia. It's clinical services and association research. He is the founding member of the International Board of Directors for the Undiagnosed Diseases Network International. He is the chair of the Diagnostic Scientific Committee of the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. And the list goes along. But for now, I let uh, Gareth take over. Gareth, thank you. Thank you, Ramaya, for that uh, very gracious introduction. It's such an honor to be talking uh, today uh, in amongst such uh, esteemed uh, colleagues. Um, I, I will uh, try to do the, uh, the audience the justice. Um, I, I hope you can all see my slides. There should be a slide that says rare disease prevention. A simple nod from somebody will get me excited. I'm gonna, can you, yep, thank you. Right. So I won't go through this in detail because a number of other people have talked about the sheer size of rare diseases um, and the fact that given the size and the enormous burden associated with rare, with, uh, rare diseases, this really is a global public health uh, pri priority. These disorders are severe, often debilitating, lifelong, associated with premature uh, morbidity, uh, premature mortality, um, and most have a genetic cause a bit over two thirds are exclusively childhood and onset. Um, half of neonatal deaths, at least in a country such as uh, Ireland or, or other high income countries are, are due to rare diseases. 60% of deaths in, those, in, that, in Ireland, for instance, uh, for between one and 14 year olds are due to rare diseases. And we'll see as the world uh, continues a demographic transition that for uh, um, low and middle income countries, that uh, there'll be a transition to these similar sorts of disease profiles and burdens. Um, the mental health impact of the uncertainty around rare diseases is, is enormous. Um, in the United States, up to 50%, 5-0% of paediatric inpatient hospital costs um, are attributable to genetic and mostly rare uh, diseases. Approximately 5% only at this current time have a specific drug therapy, but there are many things that can be done for any individual living with a rare disease to improve their lives. In the very small population in which I live in Western Australia, which is only a tiny two and a half million people, and just for children, there are about 63,000 children living with a rare disease. So that fills up our, our, uh, our largest sporting stadium. Um, or if we thought about it from an Indian perspective, it would fill many, 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 many sporting stadiums. And that's just with the children living with rare diseases. When we think about prevention, I think it's important to take an overall view of prevention and think about the four pillars of prevention, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary prevention. And each of these is a massive opportunity to, for, uh, to alleviate burden, to innovate, to improve, to save costs to improve lives in health and, 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 social, and broader social systems. So primary prevention is really preventing the disease in the first place. Um, and that's often where people's minds go to when the word prevention is, met, is, is, is mentioned. And it's one important aspect of, uh, of the suite of approaches to uh, preventing the burden of, uh, of rare diseases. And we've seen initiatives um, in the birth defect space, because many birth defects are rare diseases. In fact, birth defects cumulatively are the largest class of rare diseases, um, certainly in children. Um, and so we see things like folic acid supplementation or food fortification, or other mental health, maternal health interventions. 
when we think about uh, neural tube defects, for instance, in our own state, we've seen that to, with adding folate to foods, we've seen a 50% reduction in neural tube defects in young mums um, and a 75% reduction in our Australian Aboriginal population. Um, there are also measures like preconception carrier screening, and I think we've uh, heard about uh, efforts in uh, thalassemia um, as, a, as, a, as a test bed and a foundation potentially which can be built on um, to inform uh, reproductive, uh, reproductive, cho to re reproductive choices. There's secondary prevention. Um, so let, we, can, we can prevent the, or remediate the symptoms of disease with early with prenatal diagnosis or, with, uh, or with, newborn, with newborn screening. There's tertiary prevention, which is reducing or preventing the complications of a disease. And really um, early and accurate diagnosis, which is the portal to best medical care is a critical area for, uh, for, tertiary, uh, for tertiary prevention and, and for much more or for management, because with better disease management, you will reduce the costs and burden of, a, of, uh, of rare diseases. And those health system savings can then be repurposed and used for non-rare disease initiatives, or they could be used for funding therapies or funding uh, registries. Um, so um, really the diagnostic advances and management efficiencies can, can drive health systems efficiencies. Um, and it's critical that also, um, talking about the cross-sector things um, and it was, uh, it was very heartening to hear um, the, the representative from the government of India, from the Department of Pharmaceuticals, uh, talking about the breadth of agencies that potentially um, could assist in, this, in these areas because really this is a, a whole of community, uh, not just a whole of health uh, con concern and opportunity. And quaternary prevention, which I think is important in, uh, in, the, res, in the rare disease sector, I guess in particular with the advances in genomic testing technologies. And really it's about first doing no harm. Um, and so in one of those areas we can think about with genomic testing is, is false positive genomic findings. Um, because those false positive findings then often lead into anxiety, to further investigations, um, and the opportunity costs they're in in a, in a, in a, in a closed funded uh, uh, health system. And so it's critical that, uh, that efforts are, are, are done to prevent uh, those harms and, and uh, some of the fundamental things to, uh, to do that are having um, accurate and uh, comprehensive genomic reference data for the population in which the genomic test is being performed because um, that really does very significantly reduce false positives. And there are also approaches to genetic counselling and how deploy genomic testing that can also reduce uh, adverse effects and, and really target uh, your interventions. In terms of preconception carrier screening, um, certainly in the Australian experience, um, it's potentially a very powerful uh, tool. Um, but again, it's, it's critical that it is community engaged, that it's community driven, that you're responding to the needs of the community and that there's genomic and, and, phenoty and phenotypic, i.e. clinical reference data that allows you to interpret those test results. Because as you advance into preconception carrier screening, you have no phenotype to interpret your gene test results against because the phenotype is not yet, not yet manifested. So there's a real opportunity for population-wide um, and targeted prevention um, that really can uh, create very um, significant opportunities for, for people, for their families, for the broader community and for health and uh, further social systems. And the opportunity um, in India is to uh, address this and, and to advance the, way, the, the ways that they have with the very significant uh, new initiatives that are supporting uh, uh, the implementation of uh, rare disease therapy care and innovation and to avoid the uh, potential for a scattergun uh, uh, approach. Um, Thinking about uh, some things in our own uh, domain um, that are, are keys, uh, 
learnings, I guess, is the, the opportunities one has to start from a foundation. So, um, and to, and to look at what is already existing and, and how you might partner with those initiatives uh, to build. Uh, again, I come back to the thalassemia screening initiative as, as one thing that was mentioned, for, inst for instance. The, it's also important when thinking about the different approaches in terms of prevention is to think about how they're different and also how they're the same and not to unnecessarily conflate uh, say, for instance, newborn screening and preconception carrier screening. There are some similarities in the principles, but there's also some key differences in how you need to, how one might best implement those programs. Um, community engagement and community-driven uh, participation is 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 critical, um, especially for population-level interventions. Um, culturally appropriate. Uh, approaches are also uh, critical because in the end of this is all about tr uh, healthcare is about trust um, and uh, one wants to prevent the loss of trust. I think another key aspect of prevention is preventing the loss of something you might have or that you've worked very hard to develop and then specifically uh, trust. Um, as an outsider looking in, uh, which is always very dangerous, um, because you can make a lot of assumptions and get things very, very wrong. Um, and so with those caveats, some things that, um, that strike me um, as particular opportunities in, uh, for, in, for India, not only for Indians living with a rare disease um, and their families, but also for the global, communi global community, because I think there really are a number of areas that India can be global leaders and that can develop solutions that they translate globally. Um, there is clearly the, the very significant possibility for leapfrogging. That is taking what has been learned from other domains and then starting from a new starting point and in fact, and in fact advancing upon those at a faster rate. Um, and um, I'll draw your attention to, for instance, the leapfrogging initiative with the World Economic Forum. Um, the, I think in, when I, uh, there are a number of leadership spaces that are, I think well developed could be accelerated in India. Again, I, I, I say, uh, I run the great risk of being an outsider, uh, uh, making uh, grievous errors in interpreting the, the, the local dynamic opportunities. But these are, these are thoughts that have been percolating and, 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 I, and I share them in, with those caveats. So certainly there are, there are great uh, opportunities with Indian biotechnology, data analytics, information systems, therapeutics. I think particularly about um, not just new therapies, but also the generics. Um, because there are a number of rare diseases where uh, generics will in fact be an important part of their, of their, uh, of their treatment approach, as well as uh, repurposing. Again, thinking about system-wide government-backed um, national initiatives that one could build upon in the, in the, uh, for the rare disease uh, space. I think about the uh, RBSK uh, program, which uh, concentrates on, uh, uh, on uh, disabilities, uh, uh, birth defects, um, and develop and developmental disorders and intellectual, uh, dis and intellectual disability, because so many um, So many of those areas completely have a very high level of overlap with uh, with rare, with uh, rare diseases. We've mentioned that um, birth defects are a large class of mainly rare diseases, um, and that they're the single largest class of rare diseases in in, chil in, in children. If we even if we drill down to things that are that are uh, elements of the uh, RBSK program and think about something like hearing loss, well, typically we think that for children about half of hearing loss has a genetic origin and each of those are various individual rare genetic uh, diseases. Increasingly, we're seeing that uh, childhood uh, heart disease in terms of congenital heart disease has a very significant uh, rare disease genetic uh, cause um, and intellectual disability. Similarly, in children, there's a very high burden of um, genetic and rare diseases as being causative of intellectual uh, disability. This is not a, a new concept. Um, a number of domains have built upon um, congenital anomaly, uh, birth defects infrastructure to serve the needs of people living with uh, rare diseases in Public Health England um, has created the National Congenital Anomaly and Rare Disease Registration Service, built, essentially building on the birth defects infrastructure to build a national registry for rare diseases and, a, and really a sort of a, a connected knowledge management, uh, knowledge management web. 
in a much smaller scale in my in my home jurisdiction of Western Australia. We're on a similar journey of, uh, of building on uh, birth defects inf infrastructure and bringing together um, other infrastructures um, as uh, for the synergies between them. It was very exciting um, to see um, some, uh, you know, new, newer government initiatives uh, in the rare disease space because clearly there's there's uh, there are both huge needs in rare disease, but also huge opportunities, um, huge opportunities for innovation, huge opportunities for in for uh, industry, um, and uh, it was uh, it was great to see the uh, the PLI scheme, um, including the mention of orphan drugs. Um, complex generics, which again, I think are important in the rare disease uh, uh, space, as, as well as other um, therapeutic uh, modalities, which will, which are uh, either important to, for, the, for the rare disease space, or in fact, the development is driven through the rare disease, uh, through the rare disease space. Um, and again, thinking about uh, uh, prevention, well, if you're going to make an intervention for a prevention, you, you, you need to be able to evaluate the impact and the outcomes of that prevention and then uh, use that to inform the future, the future agenda. Um, one of the critical things to, to doing that is making sure that your health systems can actually track people with rare diseases, can actually cumulatively count people with rare diseases because uh, typically coding systems such as ICD-10, which are often employed in many health systems, only capture about 5% of rare diseases. Um, so you're admitting 95% of the burden. Uh, you're not uh, you're you're not monitoring it. Um, could you imagine running a business where you are not monitoring 95% of your of of your of, uh, of your entities? Um, and so rare disease coding, a specific offer coding, and its introduction into health data systems is critical for the health economic arguments for the and for evaluating your inter, evaluating your interventions. And so we see, for instance, in the European Union under the RD Code project, um, the push towards implementing this in more and more data sets uh, across the EU. And certainly in Western Australia, we've, uh, we're partnering with the RD Code project to do exactly the same thing with our health data sets. Um, again, I'm aware that I'm extremely ignorant uh, um, and don't want to be in, in, insensitive uh, to uh, the, uh, the opportunities and challenges in, in India. There are so many things that I have no clue about that I'm sure are amazing opportunities waiting to be unlocked um, through, through and for India. Touching again on this both need and opportunity, we've heard mention of... Um, well, when we're talking about the number and severity of the conditions across the globe, then this really does become a human rights issue oh, and a universal health care issue. Um, the we can also think about this oh. from a discovery and innovation point of view. There's Sorry. clarity from the extremity of rare diseases. The, the conditions are so severe, if you make an intervention and it works, you're able to see that. You'll probably see it very quickly. So there's an enormous benefit from this signal to noise ratio. And we see that in the fact that nearly half of new medicines come from rare disease research. We see it recurrently. We see it in examples like treatments for common hypercholesterolemia that came from dissecting apart rare and lethal forms of hypercholesterolemia in children. We see it in digital health with advances in imaging, text mining and, and other artificial intelligence applications. We also see it in the implementation of precision medicine. If we look across the globe at various precision medicine projects or we look in our own jurisdiction, um, there are two key driver domains often for implementation of precision medicine, one being rare disease and the other being, and the other being cancer. So I think cumulatively there's enormous opportunity uh, to address severe unmet need um, through four pillars of uh, four pillars of prevention, and I think there there are particular uh, special and high impact opportunities uh, for India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth.